Hello everybody and welcome to Finding Meaning, the sixth stage of grief, part of the Good Grief Festival. I'm Liesl Dawson, a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol. I'm super delighted to introduce David Kessler, one of the world's foremost experts on grief and co-author of the classic On Grief and Grieving with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. His new book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief, brings together his personal and professional insights about grief to explore how meaning making is fundamental to the way we integrate loss and find purpose. He is the founder of grief.com, which has 5 million visits from 167 countries, and there are lots of wonderful resources there. So um, a huge welcome, David. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really honored. Um, can I start by just asking you to say something about your own personal experience of grief and the way they, they sort of influence this book? Sure. I, uh, like many people, this is a profession that uh, I feel like chose me more than I chose it. As a young boy at 13, I had a mother who was dying. At the same time, there was a, uh, a shooting here in the US, one of the first mass shootings that went on for 13 hours. And there was really no one there to help someone like me that was dealing with so much grief at a young age. Uh, so I spent most of my adult life trying to heal my own losses and learn tools to help others. And uh, I was so honored, as you mentioned, to work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and work with her on a couple of books, um, obviously adapting her stages of dying for stages of grief. I always remind people they're not linear. I always want to get that in. And I thought that of course I would deal with deep grief when I was in my 80s again and friends personally. I never imagined, why would I or anyone, that my younger son would unexpectedly die. And it just was brutal then, still brutal now in many ways. I was of course the there was a little part in my mind that was the grief expert, but I, I, I placed him on the shelf because I had to deal with this personally. And I really had those moments of thinking, is what I preach really what I'm going to do? And I had to go to grief counseling and I had to sit in a brief parents group with a cap on and glasses, three feet from my books and not being able to say, I'm him, that's me, I'm the author. I had to be the father who had to bury a child. And I'll tell you, I wanted to write a, a note to so many bereaved parents and people who have had spouses die and just say, I had forgotten how bad the pain was. And I'm so sorry, because I think we all work with it and study it. And it's so different when you're in the epicenter of it. Um, and at the same time, I was so clear, I couldn't stop it just accepting my son's death. There needed to be more. And meaning came along and I studied it and had always been fascinated by it, and Viktor Frankl's work. And I wondered how meaning would tie into grief and uh, began interviewing so many people who had a spouse die, a parent die, a child die, all kinds of losses, tragedies about how they used meaning to bring them comfort. And uh, as I began considering that as a book, so many people were like, you know, that's the sixth stage of grief. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And maybe it was a chance to go back and clear up a lot of the misunderstandings also about the stages. 
And I was so honored that the Kubler-Ross family and foundation gave me permission to add a stage to her iconic stages. So that's the short version of the book and how it came about and my own personal and professional entrance into this world. Thank you. I think that your personal story does really animate the book. And you know, you talk both as a professional, but it's very personal as well. And that makes it more powerful. It's interesting over the years, so many people have been so open about their losses to me. How could I have one and sort of go, oh, but I'm not gonna be open about mine. If I'm asking you to be open and vulnerable, I have to be that too. Can you, can you say a bit more about why meaning making is so important to grief, what the benefits are? Well, one of the things I noticed early on is meaning doesn't take away the pain. It is a cushion to the pain. The pain is part of the love. There's, there's no one that can take the pain away, nor would we want them to. Some days we would, but it's, it's still part of the love. And the other thing that I think is so important, that's a very confusing point, is people will often go, meaning? There's no meaning in a death by the pandemic. There's no meaning in a cancer death. There's no meaning in a murder. And I'll go, no, there's no meaning in the death. Meaning is in us. It's what we do afterwards. So I think that that's something for us to think about, that it's really, meaningful moments that get created by us, for us. I also often say to people, someone will go, when my loved one died, a part of me died too. And I'll go, yes, and a part of them lives on in you. And your meaning is to nurture that part that lives on in you. That makes a lot of sense. I'm interested in this being the sixth stage. I mean, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that Kubler-Ross gets a lot of stick in terms of, suppose. I mean, she's sort of misrepresented as offering very linear stages. And as you say in the book, these are descriptive, not prescriptive. They don't necessarily need to follow this timeline. And yet, I wonder if meaning making does have a temporal dimension. And I think you sort of talk about that a little bit in the book. Can you say a bit more? I mean, is this something you can do immediately or does it need to have time or does it just vary depending on the person? It's a great question. Um, you know, I think time relates to things and yet there is no timeline in grief. And it's a very nuanced thing to talk about. So for instance, I often talk about the acute phase of grief when it's just happened in our world. Then I talk about early grief and early grief to me is the first two years of grief. Then I talk about mature grief. Now, it's not two years exactly for anyone. Everything's you know a general statement. All our grief is unique, but it's helpful because how I talk to someone at a month is very different than the tools I would use if they're at two years or five years and they're feeling stuck. So there is a time element that I think we can't ignore, but we have to be careful not to create a timeline yeah. for people to get over their grief and move on because our grief is not a cold or a flu. We don't move on from our loved ones. We live with that loss and find ways to honor it. You mentioned Kubler-Ross, I always like to say, Literally in that book we did on grief and grieving, on page one, it says, there's many models for grief. There's not a map for grief. You know, the stages don't have to be linear. I, I always like to tell people, in a lot of ways, it's been our modern culture that wants to find five easy steps for grieving that really has distorted her work. And Kubler-Ross, was someone who was like, when you'd say to her, is the stage model the correct grief model? She would go, that's ridiculous. There's no model for grief. You meet people where they are. I mean, she found 
and to just personally for her, this is a woman who wrote, oh my gosh, I don't know, 26 books in so many countries, maybe even it's 41 books, thousands of lectures. And the world kept wanting to reduce her work to five words. So she was always unhappy with the whole sort of reductionist of the grief experience. So I always say, don't put that on her because we certainly uh, feel very strongly that grief is an organic experience. Even on social media, sometimes people will go, you and Kubler-Ross are trying to neaten up our grief and make us follow rules. And I'm like, Kubler-Ross was the biggest rule breaker in the world. She would have no rules. So it's interesting to see how things have changed in time. Absolutely. And I think sometimes when uh, an intellectual becomes fully integrated, that's when they reach the level of cliche. You know, I think if you read Freud, he's very different from the way Freudianism is sort of presented socially. And it's, it's almost a sign that they've become integrated. And you're right, grief is very individual, but at the same time, it's also very human. It's something that connects us. And I think most people would recognize the, the, the stages that she outlines as a very common fundamental experience of grief. Yeah, it's interesting. The Many times I find it's academics who sort of wanted to have the argument where people in grief, they're like, please, I, ju I just need help. I don't care what it looks like. And I think for some who grief is such an unknown terrain, thinking about there's this loose scaffolding that lets you know anger is normal, that lets you know I can't believe they're gone is normal, that lets you know the what ifs and if onlys are normal and the sadness is normal. And gives you a language to recognize it gives you a language, yes. like where you are at a particular moment or if you are having particular impulses, you can almost give a label to it and a name to it, which helps you recognize what you're doing. And the other thing that's happened is acceptance has taken on a finality that Elizabeth and I never intended. And that's why I thought it was really important to address that in Finding Meaning and in the sixth stage, because when people ask me, for my sister, my brother, my husband, my wife, how long are they going to grieve? How long am I going to grieve? My answer is always, well, how long are this person going to be dead? Yeah. And how, and how dead, long are you going to love them? Right. Because <laughs> if they're going to be dead a long time, you're going to grieve a long time. And it doesn't mean you will always grieve with pain. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, in time, you can grieve with more love than pain but that's at your own pace in your own way. That's lovely. Can I ask you about to sort of illuminate the different forms that meaning can take? Can you give us some examples? Sure, there's many different ways. It could be in time, you could find uh, a way to commemorate and honor the loss of your loved one. For others, it might be realizing the brevity of life and that this life is not guaranteed and that can be a major shift and change in our life. It can be that we're feeling changed by knowing the person, just that they were here in our life. Maybe we're changed by their death. We don't want other people to die the way they did. Maybe it's creating something of meaning for others. Um, you know, I think about it can change our identity. It can change our relationship with others. It can change our outlook. And it can even provide growth. You know, we talk so much about post-traumatic stress, but meaning is actually about post-traumatic growth, which happens more often. So it is so good to really put words to this so we can begin to understand it. And it also can be finding gratitude for the person who was in our life. But I always caution people that, you know, early in grief, I talk about that as you don't find gratitude, maybe you find wins. It's a win that you're still showing up for work and taking a shower and taking care of your kids. Gratitude will come much, much later and in your own time. That makes sense. So it sounds like meaning making can be both 
in activities we do to connect with people, but also in our own understanding of the way that they impacted us, the way that we carry them with us, or, you know, doing things like charity, charity, charitable work, political actions, things that kind of drive us from that. And path. of course, it can be this idea that uh, we're going to start this large organization. But I caution people that you don't have to do something big and profound. Life can be changed in your everyday moments. And that yeah. can be the meaning. That makes sense. And we've had some lovely panels on here about people who use cooking as a form of meaning making, you know, sure. making their the person they their, their mother's recipes, making them present in that way, um, doing a garden or even we had a, a, an interview today where um, we had a, a photographer talk about how his dad used to pick up rocks on the beach and he you know, Simon Bray would go along and do the same activity. And in a way, it was his own version of meaning making that was very simple, but that also brought his dad sort of into his life in a daily way. And for me, my part of my meaning is my son, David, in kindergarten, was voted the most likely to become a helper. And in life, he never got to become that helper. My meaning is possibly in death, he becomes that helper for people in this book. And, you know, me talking to you today and reaching so many people with you, this is a meaningful moment for me. Just to name those meaningful moments. Our conversation, meaningful, important for me. That it might reach one person, it's all I need. That's really lovely. Can I ask you how meaning impacts or changes our relationship with the person who's died? How does our kind of imagined relationship with them? We talk, we talk a lot about continuing bonds. You know, the death doesn't end the relationship. You carry on that relationship in this new way. And, and how does meaning making sort of fit into that? Well, it is so important, as you say, those continuing bonds. And uh, I'm not a believer in closure. I don't believe we close the door on our grief at any point. And I think meaning making is part of the connection with that person. And uh, I, I think that sometimes in death, we understand them a little better. We um, that relationship continues. I always say don't give death any more power than it already has. It can end a physical life, but not our love, not our connection. And to know that meaning can help bring us close to that person. We're, you know, I always like to be careful. There's, there's no, you know, feeling close to my son and still connecting with him through meaning is a poor substitute for him walking in and me hugging him. I mean, there's no part of me that's going, oh, we've got this wonderful thing, you're not gonna miss your loved one. No, no, gonna miss him forever. And meaning helps me sit with the pain, excavate the pain. You know, one thing you mentioned I wanna go back to is, can we get there too early? The answer to all this is yes and no. I see people who their strategy is, I'm going to pour pink paint on everything and find the silver lining. It can be a temporary fix. At the same time, there's a woman that I'm working with here. Um, you may have heard of her, Laura Berman. She has a TV show, is a relationship counselor. And she has a, um, uh, three children and her uh, middle child at 16 went on Snapchat recently, sitting at home in the pandemic. Someone said, oh, you should try a Xanax, ordered a Xanax on Snapchat, and it turned out to be fentanyl, and he died. And Laura immediately said, right now, I have to save lives. I'm going to get on every TV show and let people know your children are at risk and drugs are laced these days. And that's what she devoted 
the first week, maybe two weeks, right after her son's death. And then she said, and then I'm going into the pain. But she needed to save lives right away. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just to make sure meaning doesn't become a way you're avoiding the pain. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think we've, we've talked a lot during the festival about, you know, you have to kind of go through those feelings, of, you know, of loss, of pain. It's the only way to integrate what's happened to you and to really start to reconceive of your life without that person you love. But it's interesting. I, I like the flexibility that you might, you know, you might almost save the pain for a few weeks while you do this really important, you know, bit yeah, of charity. Yeah, she wanted to save lives. She could not live with yeah. knowing this is happening and yeah. not telling people. You know, uh, at the same time, people often get afraid they're going to lose their grief. Yeah. And I always tell them, you can't lose it. It's very patient. <laughs> it will wait for you. And it will not wait for you in a punishing way. It will wait for you in a respectful way, but no one's thrilled when the pain comes back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can you say a little bit about um, some of the barriers that people might face in terms of finding meaning after a loss? Well, I think just like we've talked about, if it's sort of your method around the pain, if it's your uh, way to try to control the pain, um, we talked about maybe at some point doing a Q&A again uh, after this festival, because I have such a fascinating clip of one person in one of my online groups who's struggling and trying to use meaning to get around her feelings and to understand we are actually designed, we are built for loss. We are designed to take a number of hits this lifetime, but when our loved one dies and their story is over, you have to grieve fully and find a way to live fully. And it is so easy, I think, for us to get lost in only their story and to think that life is over. Part of meaning for me is reminding people of their power after death, reminding people they still have a story your loved one's life was precious, and so is yours, and you continuing to live it is not a disloyalty to them, but you can live a life that honors them. That makes sense. Do you, do you also find that there are particular kinds of deaths? I think you talk about this in, in the book, you know, suicide, um, drug overdose, stillbirth, there's certain kinds of deaths where perhaps it's harder to articulate the pain or in the case of suicide, there's social stigma, which means you know people face maybe cultural social barriers as well as psychological ones to finding meaning. And we're trying to slowly but surely make that transition to understanding the reality of our being mentally compromised is an illness, it's not a choice. And addiction is an illness, not a choice. And, you know, my hope is I was privileged years ago to work with an actor here, Michael Landon. And Michael Landon's from a number of TV shows, Little House on the Prairie and all that from my childhood. And he went on one of our big shows here, The Tonight Show. And it was the first time a celebrity talked openly about cancer. And my father would tell me how when he grew up, there was a shame and stigma around cancer. And I look forward to the day because now we go, what, why would there be a shame or stigma to cancer? I look forward to the day we realize whether it's our mental capacity, our mental illness, our mental health, our, um, our addictions that we realize those are illnesses too and not deserving of a stigma. And we, we will move beyond that. Absolutely. I, I love the bit of your book where you have a kind of chart where you have mental illness, physical illness, and you compare 
the reaction, you know, mental illness, you know, it's your fault, physical illness, you kind of get empathy and it's not your fault. And again, the kind of patterns and the way that that can impact the person grieving. And I think you're right. We need to change the way we, we talk about and understand mental illness. And actually, I think when the science gives us a bit more, as, as I think, again, you say about addiction and, and, and mental illness, we'll see this as ridiculous, a bit like, you know, the way we talked about cancer. Right. You know, then there was a time people said, what did I do to bring about this cancer? I mean, you know, it's interesting. I did a talk recently on positive toxicity that we can you know, and toxic positivity that we can, you know, sort of turn a why exploration into self-blame without realizing it. That we're going, what did I do to create this cancer? Or what did I do that caused the death of my loved one? And you sort of ignore the illness, but go to your own self-blame, which is really part of bargaining and the what ifs and if onlys. And that's where I find a lot of my work with people is, is helping them with the what ifs and the if onlys and the self blame that is normal in grief, but we don't, we, it's a place we're going to visit. You just don't want to live there. And I think it's also a place people get stuck at, especially with those deaths you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we, we had a session during the festival on guilt and grief. And we talked a lot about the kind of magical thinking that's involved in death, you know, that if only I did this, I could have stopped this person dying and how, you know, it damages you. And also, I mean, I see it as a form of denial where, you know, the magical thinking is about undoing the death so that you're not actually integrating the reality of the death. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, it's, and I think you say somewhere, I wish I could remember, you probably can remember your own quote, but you say something about, you know, just because it happened before doesn't mean. Yeah, ca causal prox <laughs> proximal causation that what happened right before the death doesn't, isn't necessarily what caused the death, but our mind wants to link the two. And we'd always rather feel guilty than helpless. We'd always rather feel guilty than helpless. And so we, we try to, you know, bring about almost that negative meaning and that negative story that, oh, and it's the mind. I mean, the brain science is fascinating that it's the mind really using its protective mechanisms on a situation that it, it comes up with the wrong conclusion. Yeah, I mean, it, it really shows up how were these story making machines and that they can be something that's very damaging to us in terms of thinking that we're at fault when someone has cancer and dies. But also if we can harness that, if we can shift that, if, if we can move to a slightly more future oriented, you know, hopeful state, then we can, you know, move in the direction where meaning making is really positive. And it's about reconceptualizing our life and finding a future you know, which we can live in and include the person who's died. It's interesting. I'll give you an example that takes magical thinking a little further. And it's something I could never have done as a grief professional, but I knew differently as a bereaved person. Just like you said, there's magical thinking that children have that they're mad at mommy, mommy gets in a car accident, they think they did it. Then there's the magical thinking that we have that I could have saved them if I had just done this one thing different. The third magical thinking that does not get talked about is the magical thinking of not only if I had saved them, but if they were still alive. Now, what's fascinating is I have a number of online groups and I have this one online group that I noticed in my own grief, I often thought about what's it like? What would it be? Who would my son be today a few years later? And I would actually find comfort in that. And I noticed it's one of those things that gets shut down quickly that if we say to someone outside of our grief world, 
I wonder who my son would be. Don't do that to yourself. Don't talk that way. And so I said one day, what if, this is in the group, what if we take a session and all share our magical thinking and witness one another's stories? And I'll tell you, people talked about, and it's a huge group, it's hundreds of people all around the world, they were saying, it was one of the most profound experiences to be able to say it out loud. And before that, as a clinician, I might have said, oh, that's a very dangerous, tricky thing to do. But I knew as a bereaved person, it would mean so much. I wonder if the key there, though, is about the witnessing and the doing it in this very sort of constructive group because I think the problem is that if you get stuck in that cycle, it can be a kind of loop, you know, that you, you never kind of get out of. And, and again, right. it's, a, it's a form of denial, but somehow verbalizing it, you know, having it witnessed, being somehow recognized. And recognized in the beginning that we're opening magical thinking. Yeah. And at the end, we will close the magical thinking and come back to the reality but that we realized we can still parent our child in our heart. We can still be our brother or sisters, you know, sibling in our heart, that we will always be our parents' children. Our, you know, we will always love our spouse. It does breathe a little life into such a sad situation, but you're right. It has to be in a therapeutic context so that you're just not left stuck in your pain. Yeah, and I mean, what it reminds me of a little bit is, um, you know, people who feel guilty about some aspect of the relationship or the death. And one of the things you recommend is, you know, actually giving a verbal apology of, you know, or writing a letter and doing something really heartfelt. And, 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 I, and again, that seems to me different and active and, you know, rather than just it's sort of cycling and maybe there is something about giving that um, fantasy a voice, having it shared. Because it already has one. Yeah. We're doing it yeah. privately. Yeah. I'm not, you know, no one said to me, oh, I don't know what that is. I don't do it. I mean, everyone was like, yes, I do it. I'm in. You know, every, no one said, oh, I've never done that. Everyone had their story ready. And. I think it was just so important. And I think sometimes it's those nuances that in so many ways, my son's death, I mean, I think in meaning, there is a decision to be made. For example, after my son's death, I got a call from a woman, Diane Gray. I talk about this in the book, who was head of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation at the time. And also a bereaved parent. And she said to me, I know you are drowning and you are going to drown for a long time. She said, at some point you will hit bottom and you will have a decision to make. Do you stay there or do you kick off and begin to swim again? And I talk about in the book that meaning becomes a decision, a subtle, subtle decision we each have to make about, do we live again? You know, people always want to know, do you believe in life after death for our loved ones who have died? And I'm like, yes, I believe in the afterlife. But I also believe in an afterlife for us that, that there's life for us after our loved one's death that can actually honor them. But we're grief illiterate society. I mean, that's why I'm so thankful you're doing this festival because it gives words, it gives tools. And I always say, we're kind of teaching what our grandparents knew, great grandparents, but it's gotten lost in our productive world. I think that's really powerful. I wonder, we have a lot of questions. I, I see them coming in thick and fast. So I'm gonna to turn to that in a minute, but just that final point you made, I wonder if you wanna say a bit more about witnessing, because I think that's a really important component of the book. And again, that what seems to me turns the magical thinking negative into something positive. Can you say a little bit more about how grief needs to be witnessed? Yeah, I, I'm such a believer in witnessing grief and that 
uh, we need to see each other's grief and meaning making is so strong when someone sees my pain. You know, scientifically, we talk all the time about marrying neurons in babies. And then we often think about, you know, there's so many videos you can see of the baby smiling when the mother smiles and they're marrying neurons. We forget that those marrying neurons are still in adults and we need our pain to be seen. We're not meant to be islands of grief. And it, it's important in the healing also and finding a meaning to know that it connects us. So I'm, I'm such a big believer in the power of witnessing and also when people are like, I, I can't find any meaning. I'll go on the most basic level, you are the witness that your loved one was here. You are the one that will keep their story alive. You are the one that will remember them. And just if not witnessing that they were here is so much meaning when we just take that in. Absolutely. I mean, people, we have a huge effect on the people around us in visible and invisible ways. And I always think about the fact that we are constituted of the people we love and the experiences we've had. So, you know, we carry them with us in an embodied emotional way. Right. Um, so and, yeah, go on. and let's not forget, these are emotions that are painful. And one of the things we do in grief is we have a painful emotion and we project it for the next 40 years. And I always tell people, no feeling is final. You know, our feelings are ever changing. This particular feeling that's excruciating is not the final feeling for the rest of your life, even though it feels that way when we're in it. Absolutely, and I think you, you point out really intelligently that you know it's not about the avoidance of pain i think you say um you know something goes out of alignment when we try to avoid sadness and grief and really life is not about a pain free existence but what's much more important is what's meaningful and again i think you talk about the end of life of saying people often say you know how can i stop them from dying instead of saying how can i make the end of life meaningful. And that if we ask that question, it will reorient how we see right. the death, how we see the time, you know, but I think that's an important lesson to a world who seems to want to, you know, avoid pain. Right, we want to fight it. And the world and our experience on, on planet earth is just not made up of hilltops and peaks. There's also valleys. You know, one thing I always found interesting and I can't wait to be there and be places again physically. And in my retreats and workshops, when we were, you know, a few hundred people gathering, many times they would be in hotel ballrooms. And after the workshops were over, it was us. And then in the next room, maybe it was the accountants. And the next room on the other side was the nurses or whatever it was. And the cleaning crew afterward would always say, hey, what were you teaching? And I would go, why do you want to know? And they would go, well, because your group was laughing the most. And I would go, oh, it was grief. And they would go, what kind of grief? And what they couldn't understand is that when your bandwidth has been so expanded with sadness and pain, it also has the capability to find even more joy and laughter in life but it's a lot of work to get there. I don't pretend it's not. It, it loss definitely shows us the preciousness, the fragility of life, you know, the fact it's gonna go. So you should, you should enjoy it now and also take hold of the people you love. And at the same time, it's interesting, someone in one of my cancer groups years ago said, and I can't get up every morning and appreciate every single sunrise. Yeah. You know, that like there's a finding, um, the extraordinary in the ordinary. Yeah, yeah. And that life, you know, again, life is made up not just of these blissful moments, right, but, the, right. but the meaning is made in the small moments, the supposedly humdrum and the ways we connect with people. It doesn't always have to be something, you know, dramatic or extraordinary. It can be just the daily routines that connect us. Right. Can I turn to some questions? Please? Yes, I would love that. Uh, we have lots. 
Um, I'm going to start with what about sort of coping mechanisms? What do you do in the moment when you are overcome by overwhelming grief? Those moments when you feel like you're being ripped apart? I think it's important to recognize that is what grief feels like. The intensity of the grief is in proportion to the intensity of the love. And I think we, we have minimized in our society what grief looks like. We think it's going to be a little crocodile tear at the funeral. And, and I'm here to tell you, it is excruciating. It is. That is what grief looks like. I don't have a hack or a trick to go around that excruciation. But I can tell you, if you can just let that be grief, it will change. It will change. I mean, I've had a child that's died. I've been through a shooting, my parents. I mean, it will change. There, there can be a, a life worth living, but you do have to go through the dark night. And that moment is the dark night. And if anything might help you is to just think about this is not the way it's always going to be. There is some love underneath this that I will find someday. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question about barriers to making meaning. Could you please talk about the blocks to making meaning? I'm thinking about guilt and other emotions. Are there words or tools to try to help with these blocks? Absolutely. I, you know, one of the things that I think has been one of the misunderstandings about the new book, Finding Meaning, is people think it's a book all about how to find meaning, but it's really about how to excavate the pain so that you find the meaning underneath. And I think we get stuck uh, when so many of the temporary feelings we may have feel like they're becoming permanent. We get stuck when our loss becomes the focus of our life ongoingly. I mean, when grief first occurs in our world, it is our focus, but it can become a point where we become dedicated to the loss. And we subtly do this without our knowledge. And I think that's when you really need to find those tools. There's tons of tools I have out there that they can find on this. And, you know, just a few of those that as you're thinking about uh, these feelings, you may find yourself going, I'm always going to be in pain, or I'm never going to be happy again. Take words like always and never out of your vocabulary. The truth is you're in pain today. We don't know what you're going to look like in two months, six months. You're, you're never going to be happy again is what it feels like today. But it actually is possible later in your life. I think that makes sense. Would you also say, David, that you know, maybe in some ways the guilt is something that needs to be worked on almost first, that that, if, yes. if that, you know, if that's a barrier that almost you need to somehow deal with that issue before you move on to meaning making. Absolutely. And that's why literally the people who work with me online, they see usually what I say is you, you know, will give me a what if or a guilt. And my first question is, when did your loved one die? And if you tell me a month or six months ago, my answer is going to be, I'm glad you have a detective hat on. It's important you ask why. It's important you get information. It's important you play through the what ifs and if onlys. If you're later in grief, then we're going to work through those what ifs to really try to see, are they true? But what I find, and I'm sure you and many others find, is when we ask the why or the what ifs out loud, people are like, stop, don't do that, move on. And the questions need to be asked. Even if there will never be an answer, they deserve to be asked. I think, yeah, that makes sense. And we already talked a little bit about something in your book, which is actually saying a verbal heartfelt apology about guilt. Again, thinking, thinking about the guilt, but you also say, which I think is very good, you might also think about ways to, to, to do something in your life about that guilt. So, you know, I think you say in the book, you know, if you had a plan to do something with that person or, you know, I mean, in your own life with your son, 
you know, he died of a drug overdose and you've now worked to stop other kids from having this experience. So again, you can do something, you know, sort of positive and active that might free up the guilt, which then might sort of allow you to, and that might be a form of meaning making. And it is sort of a lot of this is taking those things that we feel victimized by, death victimizes us. And how can we turn the passive mourning into active grieving? and do something active. And I just also want to caution people, it can be the smallest changes. I don't want people to think meaning making means I've got to go volunteer and change the world. It can be such small, subtle things in our lives. That, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We have a question about um, sort of griefs piling up. My mom died in October suddenly from pneumonia. Hmm. My dad died in December after a diagnosis of cancer. How can I grieve for them at the same time? I don't believe you can. I don't believe we can grieve multiple losses. I think we can only grieve individual people. Here's what I have people do. And just like so many times people almost have what I call a season of death that you just get so many deaths happening and it does become just one on top of the other. We have to, you know, we often talk about compartmentalizing is not healthy. I have found the opposite many times in multiple loss. You have to compartmentalize. You can't just grieve these multiple losses. You have to take time and, um, you know, take a day or an evening for your mom. Go and do her favorite things or the things you did with her. The same with your dad another day. You, ha you can't grieve the multiples, but you can grieve dad or sis or your child and give them each a day or an hour or, an, you know, an evening that, to yeah. connect with them separately. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that emotionally that will help you to kind of differentiate the right. sea of emotions that are sort of coming towards you. And to go back to grief as an organic experience, one of the things in my old physical retreats when we were in the physical world, I would have people write a letter and they're like, I can't write a letter. There's too many people. And I'd say, pick one. And they'd go, I can't, I can't, I can't choose one. And we almost think choosing one grief to work on is like disloyal to the others and it doesn't work that way and you know one day I woke up and for some reason my father was on my mind and I saw his watch and I decided to wear his watch and it was a really sweet day of remembering my dad but if I let my mind run loose my mind could have said why are you thinking about your 84 year old dad when your son died, he's got to have the grief. But sometimes I say, let the grief speak to us versus us telling the grief what to do. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a question about social expecta expectations. This is from Pauline. How can we respond to families or friends who expect us to be recovered or in a better place well before we are ready? Such a great question. So first of all, we all have different places we're at. Here's a few of them. Sometimes maybe you just, you don't have it in you to deal with and you're just like, thanks for your condolence and you walk away. Other times there's been things people have said and I just go, ouch. And they go, what do you mean? And I'll go, well, that hurt. You know, you're kind of telling me I'm grieving wrong. The other option is if you're feeling up to it, we have to be the grief educators to say, I know you're trying to be helpful. And I just want you to know, cause you're gonna be in grief someday. You're gonna help other people in grief. You're gonna have other friends. You wanting me to get over it is not helpful. And here's what you could do instead that would be more helpful. Just tell me you're going to just be with me. The other thing is so many times 
being the grief specialist, I have the family members come to me and going, we want the old Janet back. And I'll go, Janet would like the old Janet back. But Janice's husband died and Janet is now different and she can't be who she is. And you've got to meet the new Janet because Janet's having to accept herself. And the last thing I will say that's the little secret in this is our grief makes other people uncomfortable. And sometimes they're wanting us to get over it so they don't have to be uncomfortable. And I tell people in grief, our job is not to change, distort ourselves, make ourselves digestible to make other people comfortable. It's not our job. I think those are very wise words. We've had some questions come in about COVID. So um, there are two, but they're kind of related. So I'm going to ask them both. Great. I'm currently looking into something called the epidemic of grief ahead of us as part of the pandemic. Each person that died leaves grieving people behind. How do you see the challenges ahead? So that's question one. And related to that, what will the challenges be in the coming months or years after so many people have died during the pandemic? I think I'm beginning to see that now. It's interesting. We talk about, some people have said, gosh, I'm dealing with the post-traumatic stress of COVID. And I'm like, it's not post yet. It's not even post, we're in it. We're in the stress of COVID. And the reality is, and I'm seeing this now in the different groups I have that, people are beginning to see the world move on. And they are beginning to see this, let's get everything open, we're getting vaccinated, let's put all this behind us and just that year is lost. And it can't be the lost year. Too many people died. And I, I, you know, I say, and I'm trying to encourage people as much as I can, whether it's on TV or in writing, that, at going back to grief must be witnessed. People are gonna to wanna to start having funerals that they haven't had and memorials in the last year. And the tendency is to say to them, why, why go back and do that? They're gone, it's been a year, but grief still must be witnessed and we need to show up. We need to show up still. I, I don't care that it's been a year, when you're vaccinated, show up at their house and say, here's the casserole. I should have come over a year ago and I couldn't, but I'm here now. It's not too late. That's gonna make the difference moving forward. Very important points. And I, I mean, my hope really is that the conversations that COVID has started will begin a change in the way we approach death and grief that it becomes a much more discussable topic and then it's more mainstream, not about numbers, but about real people, real families who've lost, you know, someone they love. Yeah, because unfortunately the numbers have become numbing to people and we need to make them real people again. Absolutely. Um, we have a question about, about you. Um, since my son Josh died, post-traumatic growth has changed me so much including my address book. What has changed most for you since your own son, David, died? Wow, it's a big question. I think so many things have changed. I think, you know, going by what she says, I always say our address book is by invitation only. You know, I'm, I'm trying to have relationships that satisfy me more and give and take with others. I love making meaning in the world. Um, I think I have a deeper connection with people who are grieving now. Um, you know, there's a, a, some things also have changed. It's interesting. You know, I'm not one of those people that lays in bed in the morning and sort of goes, all right, today's gonna to be an amazing day. I'm inviting amazing day in. I'm more someone who goes, oh, I'm gonna have that stressful meeting and then I'm gonna have that tough meeting. And now I go, those are stories I'm making up about my day. 
let me just be present. And even if it's a stressful meeting, I get to be here and enjoy a stressful meeting. And, uh, you know, I, I recently moved into my 60s and my gosh, in, in my work, 60 is a privilege. 60 is a privilege. I mean, I'm so aware of people who aren't getting to have these bad days. So part of me is even trying to have a little peace, sometimes appreciation, even for the bad days. That's lovely. We have a question about complicated grief. David, you explained that there's no timeline or model for grief, but doesn't complicated grief have some sort of timeline to it? I think of complicated grief as grief that's asking for your attention. And I think grief can ask for your attention anytime. I do think if there is a what if or if only or self blame, um, a horrendous death that we haven't found the way in or the tools to address it or the person to work with, it can complicate our grief. But I'm also a big believer that, you know, unless your grandmother was 105 and she had an amazing life and everyone was there with her at the end, all grief is a little complicated. And our work is to sort of witness and examine and talk about that complications to get the grief moving again. It's really grief that's not moving. And I think, you know, it's interesting when I always say when my air conditioning and heating system is having problems, I get support. If my car's not working or something's going wrong, I get support. We have a loved one die and just think we need to do it all ourselves. And I encourage people whether it's groups or counselors or whatever helps you to get support because we, we don't need to stay stuck in the complicated grief. I think that's right. And complicated grief seems very linked to trauma and it also seems linked to denial and avoidance. And you can see how that can prevent you from actually feeling the pain of grief which is the thing that helps sort of move it through your body, through your psyche. So in some ways, I think, you know, that's right. Somehow getting, I think complicated grief often needs some kind of intervention or support and in order to move it. All grief does not have trauma, but all trauma has grief. Yeah. And it's important to understand. I think about there being three things. There's the grief, there's the trauma, and we get stuck in the traumatic moments or hours or days. And part of the work is to bring people and our loved ones out of those traumatic moments so that we don't stay stuck there, which often complicates our grief. Absolutely. We're sort of getting to the end. I wonder if we can sneak in one quick question about suicide. I lost my brother to suicide eight and a half years ago. Since then, we've struggled to cope with the loss, particularly my parents. I'm constantly living in fear that one day soon my parents will die. How does one deal with this? Well, it's, it's challenging to know there's only so much you can do for another person. Part of the work is what they do on their own. So you can provide them tools. And if that's helpful, great. But at a certain point, we can't do anyone else's grief work. We can only do our own. So I would encourage you to work through all the aspects that you can work through and then share that with your parent. Not tell them, here's what you got to do. And we talked about, I'm going to send out some resources to everyone. And one of them is going to be a free course that will help deal with a death by suicide. So there, there's resources you can share with them but you can't make them grieve the way you think they should. Wise words. Yes, we'll be following this up. 
with an email which will invite you to join grief.com which will give you some resources we're practically out of time um, so i just want to say such a huge thank you um, here is david's wonderful book um, which i very much recommend you to buy this has been such an amazing interesting enlightening session thank you so much david for joining good the good grief festival uh -huh. Thank all of you. I so appreciate you doing this and honored to be part of it. It's been an absolute joy. Bye for now, but we'll see you again.